kind of go all people who do something that is more or less community management, and I'll let them explain what that is. No, sorry, no, no music. Thanks for the intro, Sean. Can, uh, can everyone hear me okay? I didn't actually hear the intro, but I'm assuming it was highly complimentary, and I'm blushing. <laughs> Um, cool, so uh, just a, a couple words um, before we, we really dive into things. Um, the panel's listed as an hour and 15 minutes long. We're going to do you the favor and not take that time. Uh, so we'll probably talk for, up here for about 45 minutes or so and then open it up to questions. Because um, no matter how cool everyone is, uh, you can get bored. Uh, and the second bit um, is we're going to try to focus on being as practical as we can uh, about this stuff. I mean, you know, I think. You probably wouldn't be here if you didn't already kind of believe in it. Uh, we expect that you guys are pretty familiar with theory and potential. So uh, we're going to try to, at least I'm going to do my best to uh, squeeze as much as I can out of these guys because they know what they're talking about. So uh, I'm Samil. Uh, I'm moderating. Uh, I run the innovation unit of BBH called BBH Labs. Uh, and I'm going to let these guys uh, introduce themselves. Sure. Um, this is Matthew Breimer. I am the co-founder of General Assembly, which is a Educational campus and community focused on technology, design, and entrepreneurship uh, here in New York. Hi, I'm Paul Scavon. I'm the online social media manager for Techniza, uh, one of the major real estate companies in Brazil. Uh, my name is Toby Daniels, the co founder and CEO of Crowd Centric, uh, also the founder and executive director of Social Media Week. I'm Alex, I'm uh, the engineering community manager for Local Motors, and we basically do open source cars and open source automotive development. Uh, my name is Ali um, and I have two companies. One is seven years old and the other one is seven months old. I speak about them as if they were children. <laughs> um, uh, the, 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 I have She Says, um, the URL is vr which is kind of more educational kind of um, enterprise for kind of women um, in digital and women creative and I also have um, Something called I shout. We were always everybody shout, and it's for you know it's based on crowdsourcing principles. But for it's for women to reply to kind of um, kind of uh, client briefs from brands that want to target women. But men in the audience, I don't hate you guys. No, 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 no one in my community does. The community is only is is mostly women only. But that doesn't mean that we hate men. Okay, guys. Feel relieved somewhere. So. The title of the panel is Building and Working with Communities. Um, so actually, Ali, I'm going to start with you. Uh, and for the rest of the panel, I'm going to call you Ali, as I've now learned, uh, to show how legit I am. Um, do you want to just tell everyone a little bit about your experience building communities, since you have two? Yes, um, I think uh, you know what worked really well for, for She Says, for example, is um, you know uh, I think we weren't afraid of starting really small and kind of bootlegging it. Um, and I think that's, and, and I think the main thing that makes a community really big is actually having a real unmet need for that community. And our community grew. Like every time we had an event, every month, you know, 50 more people would show up. That because it just, just because there was a real need for it, and then it got bigger. So I think experience number one is, is like how we build it. It's just kind of we build it out of a need, you know, and we let it grow organically. Um, and I think that kind of really helped. And I'm trying to do. The same thing with, um, with the, the, the second community. Cool. And uh, Matthew, you're kind of on the flip side of this. I mean, we, we, it's called actually technically online communities. Yours is uh, potentially that, but can you just tell the group a little bit about General Assembly? Sure. Um, so, uh, we, General Assembly is a physical place. Um, it's a 20,000 square foot campus, um, 20th and Broadway. Um, we basically took over this big loft uh, in a building, which is a completely empty box, white walls columns, and there was a, no walls, no, no, it wasn't even a floor. Uh, and we built it out into our own sort of custom design campus with um, uh, classrooms, seminar rooms, library, kitchen, lounge area, event space, co-working space. And, uh, and with all that, we opened about a year, just over a year ago, a year and a month. Um, we have a community of early stage entrepreneurs and startups which we've curated and sort of handpicked as a selection and application process. And those startups are, uh, and entrepreneurs are residents at General Assembly. They pay a monthly membership fee, they are members. Um, they we might have them to teach classes. Uh, all of our educational programs are taught by practitioners. And 
so that community forms a good sort of foundation and base of uh, instructors and subject matter experts who we can then pull into the classroom and teach their skills to a wider, more public audience. And when you say hand selected, what? Because uh, that's a luxury I think a lot of community managers don't actually have. Um, how did you decide who was kind of invited into the community? I mean, did you have predefined roles in your head about what they should be doing, or you just thought these are interesting people, or sure, how, how sure. did that happen? So one of the things that we sort of considered early on is is how we want to think about community um, and just uh, sort of perspective when we were starting General Assembly. So on the one hand, if you just have a community that is entirely closed and is entirely selective, there's no sort of way for like outsiders to get in, um, you run the risk of being some sort of exclusive club that has certain connotations. At the same time, going the other end of the spectrum, if you're completely open, there's no curation, there's no um, there's no selectivity, there's no focus, uh, you run the risk of, of you know, the quality of the, of the engagements and the community and the interaction just going down to zero, right? If you look at like YouTube comments, for example, um, completely uncurated and just worthless, right? Uh, but the other, you look at other forums, other online communities, we have a lot of people here, and the engagement is incredible to the point where you can actually create an entire you know, business out of it. And so we wanted to sort of balance those. So on the one hand, we were seeking um, sort of high potential, uh, scalable early stage startups um, who, who's, uh, whose founders really cared about sharing, interacting, being a part of a greater community. Um, we had some entrepreneurs approach us and they say, well, they want to be a part of General Assembly, but they're in stealth mode, they can't talk to anyone. And those people are just not a good fit, right? You don't want to be in stealth mode and not be able to interact. Um, we wanted people who were very interested in not just getting from the community, but really adding to it and giving it to it. Uh, whether in the form of just sort of being useful, you know, having those sort of serendipitous interactions, bumping into people, potentially teaching, potentially writing blog posts, potentially, um, you know, hosting events or whatnot. So we're looking for those kind of people. And then on the other end, we also wanted to balance that very curated, very selective piece by having all of our classes and events and workshops and educational programs be open to the public. And that's a big part of General Assembly now. And at this point, we have about three to 4,000 people coming in every single month into campus to take classes, attend events, do workshops and stuff. Um, but only about 300 or so people are, are members um, and actually working on this space. So at this point, the greater, the broader community um, is bigger than the selective piece, but I think having a very strong core at the end of the day, when you're building and growing a community is incredibly vital. So those, having the right early adopters, the right, the right core people, I think determines like the early DNA that then becomes something bigger. So I have a bit of a confession actually for all the panelists, which is uh, I don't actually know what community management is. Uh, I come from an agency background, so like we give each other awards for responding to like Facebook posts. It's like, oh, that was cool. You did that. Look at that brand being nimble. Um, so I'd love to just kind of ask you guys uh, what the hell community management actually means. I'm looking at you, Toby, because uh, you're nodding this vigorously. Um, <laughs> but, uh, nodding vigorously because I, I think you guys really are awesome at that. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, no, tell us a little bit about what community management is. Uh, it, it, it's an incredibly difficult kind of question to answer in the sense that it's changing so much at the moment. The definition, the, the requirements of a, a strong community manager. I, I think the first thing I want to do is just um, dispel a few myths. Community management is not the domain of the most junior people within the organization. Community management is absolutely not something that you kind of just give to an individual and hope that they can sort of maintain and manage communications online or through whatever sort of social media channel they happen to be interacting in. Community management is, I think, one of the most important emerging new disciplines that's going to fundamentally and radically change the way that we do business. And uh, as the, the sort of CEO of the company and, and, and as the executive director of Social Media Week, I consider myself a community manager. You know, and, I, and I take that job and the responsibility of community management incredibly seriously. I am invested every single day in interactions with the community. In, in a way, it is, is very specific um, and germane to, to what I do and the role that I perform, but it's still community management nonetheless. So I think that um, what it is is something that's starting to infiltrate all disciplines within an organization. Um, it's starting to break down silos within the internal makeup of an organization, and it's becoming the most important external communication channel for a startup or for a major corporation. And I think 
that we shouldn't underestimate the importance of community management as we move forward and think about how do we reorganize ourselves around what's happening in, in social media and social communications. So just so I'm clear, would you say the most important channel for, for that type of outreach? I mean, are you saying even compared to, let's say, uh, formalized like purchase media and whatnot for these big companies, you feel like you know through through the community actually that is that is a more valuable touch point potentially for, for these big companies. I certainly want to avoid talking about channels in, in a sort of siloed sense. Yep. It's not kind of what, what I mean um, because I think businesses have multiple channels that, that come out of all sort of aspects of, of the organization. Um, I think that that um, I guess what really what I'm referring to is just that the the requirement or, or the need for people to understand that this is a, a skill set that needs to be adopted by, let's say, people in HR and people in product design and people in marketing or customer service. And it, this skill set is, I think, universally applicable across every uh, sort of vertical or silo within a business because ultimately the best community managers are the ones that understand how to connect and communicate. It's not just about pushing out messaging, it's really about listening to what people are talking about. It's about making connections or bridging connections. It's about knowing when to pull someone into a conversation and when to ask them to leave. Um, and I think these skills, which we're just starting to kind of understand right now, are skills that need to be learned by everybody. Um, and do you guys feel, I mean, is the collective sense uh, on the panel that big companies value that as a skill, like they see that as something that they need to keep track of at a very senior level, like the C-suite of big companies. And Paulo, you, you work at a very big company, uh, one that isn't built around a community per se, but you've certainly brought a community into it. Uh, do you want to just tell, tell these people a little bit about uh, just kind of how that's worked and, and if you think that's valued? Uh, actually, uh, the EdTech is quite a big, big company, it's a local company. Like uh, it has business in 22 different cities in Brazil, but it's only in Brazil. So uh, we're trying to, to, to push forward uh, some initiatives uh, related to, to virtual communities in our marketing and product development strategies uh, so far. And um, I would say that we have uh, three, three ways of engaging communities uh, inside the company in this moment. Uh, we built uh, Open innovation platform called Technics Ideas a few months ago. Uh, we really started, like, like we have already uh, more than a thousand ideas published uh, from customers to where we can find some insights of how to improve our, our products and the way we do business in Brazil. So, how do you improve the actual buildings that you're building? Those yeah. ideas are coming from? Yeah, that's the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, uh, we don't have the whole picture from that. Usually we have just insights uh, that can somehow uh, initiate a, a, a conversation inside the company about trends, what trends uh, these uh, customers are showing us. And so from that ideas we can start to, to uh, implement uh, modifications in our product development so we can uh, achieve in a better way um, our customers through our products. That's the way. And also we have a very strong uh, way of uh, innovating with uh, supply, suppliers for the, com for the company. We call that process uh, fast dating. It's very fast dating. Fast dating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, a, it's a very close to speed dating and yeah. uh, to be viewable. Mm -hmm. But we do it in a different way. In now, now Toby's nodding vigorously. It's fast dating. Yeah. It's fast dating. Yeah. Fast or slow yeah. speed dating. Yeah. <laughs> Try to be faster. <laughs> But uh, the, 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 the main thing is uh, we try to, to, to put uh, startups and um, entrepreneurs into contact with our company um, as much as, I can, as we can so we can find out big opportunities that are not being uh, used by other competitors in our country. So uh, it's a very nice way to yeah. somehow speed things uh, to, to find opportunities in the market. Yeah, you know, and Alex, you're on the exact opposite end of that, right? So as these guys are looking at communities for new ideas or kind of optimization, I mean, what the community does is core to Local Motors as a company, right? I mean, oh, Local yeah. Motors is not a company without a community, and you're the head of that community. So can you talk a little bit about, like, how you would then define community management at a company like Local Motors? Well, I mean, I guess for, for Local Motors community management, 
community management in any sense is, is uh, really defined by I mean, the community itself as a resource. And so community management of that resource is really dictated by, by what, it's, what it's doing for you. And that, it may be a resource for the company, it may be a resource for the community itself. You know, but uh, for local motors, really, what it's about is uh, trying to local motors. We do uh, our development, and we encourage the development of our community's projects through um, basically the the passion that we all share, which is you know the automotive world. And so, um, trying to manage that community is really about trying to uh, essentially keep people feeling or keep people engaged with what brought them into that passion in the first place. Try to uh, take the passion that they were all experiencing, um, you know, in a decentralized fashion and bring it all into one place where it can all manifest in one place. And then uh, also trying to, uh, you know, provide the right, you know, go out to the community, figure out what kind of tools they need, figure out what their pain points are, and then bring them uh, the the resources that they would need to enable them to continue on with following that passion, following that focus, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. I see you nodding over there. Yeah, I mean, I think the what Toby said just made me think, um, you know, because they're saying, oh, community managers are not, you know, just the gym, almost junior yeah. person, they think they are super important. And I'm actually wondering, and you said, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a community manager in a way, and I was thinking, I am a community manager in a way too, and I'm also the CEO of a company, so I was kind of thinking whether being a CEO is all, being a, is all about being a community manager just made me think that. And, um, and I think that decentralization is really important from what you're saying, to make a community really healthy. Um, you know, um, uh, the, the way that she says works, we, she's, the, the she says exists in 17 countries, and every single country uh, where she says exists is totally autonomous. Um, we don't dictate what each chapter should do, and I think decentralization is really important. And it's a little bit about how the, why the Alcoholics Anonymous is so famous, <laughs> because they act, each chapter administers itself. There is no one single centralized kind of person, you know, um, dictating on what they do, and, and I think it's really important. And just to kind of backtrack a little bit, because I didn't answer your first question well, um, a little story. Uh, she says she says started in 2007 with you know women just helping each other, having monthly events. We also do courses, and it's very educational. And then with Shout, we were thinking, what can we do with like all these smart women in advertising around the world? You know, that is not just educational. So we just created Everybody Shout, which is like a, a kind of a, a platform based on crowdsource principles, where clients put their briefs up, and the women will work and reply to their brief in their own time with whoever they want. They can choose to work together or not. They can choose to meet physically or not. Um, and that's kind of basically, you know, I, I think what's interesting about the two communities that, uh, is that, that one feeds the other. If one is more educational, um, the educational part feeds the kind of more working and business part, and then they get better in what they do, you know, and then they get educated and they do better work on the platform. So I kind of think it's, it's really interesting, this kind of, you know, having an educational community that feeds a working community, which is a bit, little bit of what General Assembly is doing as well, you know, having the educational part and like the working part. And maybe, maybe management is the wrong term for it. It's more like you're a community enabler. You figure out, you, you know, you're trying to, to figure out, uh, you, you know, you're not actually managing the, the community itself. You're figuring out what are the drivers for that community, and you're just trying to do everything in your power to, yeah. you know, break down the walls that actually uh, get in the way of, of that driver, you know, going to its full potential and letting the community, like you said earlier, grow organically and behave organically. I also think it's a little bit like building a house. I mean, you know, there are multiple disciplines required to get to that kind of end product where all the bricks are placed, the windows are in, the lawn is like laid, etc. Um, and it requires, you know, it's a process, it's a methodology that requires design and architecture to build, um, but it requires a whole different set of skills to maintain um, and to, to moving away from the house analogy, because of course houses don't necessarily grow, but uh, you know, to grow and develop, nurture the community over time is a very different set of skills. And, and I think it's, you're probably right, community management suggests somehow that it's the domain of an individual or even the domain of an apartment, and that's wrong, because it, it shouldn't be. Um, it, it's a, a process um, and, and an ongoing, continuous one. 
Yeah, that's an interesting point that getting it, like building the house is different than maintaining the house, just in terms of skills, right? So if you're a big company, and you know, more and more, this stuff's getting attention, right? I and mean, people are like, okay, they look at companies like Local Motors and go, that sounds really complicated, and somehow a community is designing and engineering their cars. I mean, that just, as a, as a sentence, seems very uh, difficult to achieve. So how do you, if you're a company or a person within an organization, how do you learn that skill? Like, what is it that, I mean, you know, right? I think there is a reason that a lot of junior people end up with these jobs. A, it's not valued by the company enough, but B, uh, oh, that kid's on Facebook, cool. Yeah. You know, that, that's not like community management, you know. Uh, and, and, and I think, going back to the house analogy for a second, how do you build a house like one brick at a time, right? Yeah. Um, that's the first thing that people need to understand. That, that this, this, this stuff doesn't just magically kind of happen. It's really hard work, and it requires uh, a, a lot of painstaking kind of effort to continue to lay brick upon lit brick. Um, and it's only when you look back at a completed house and think, wow, you know, that's pretty amazing. And if someone comes in from the outside and looks at how the hell did you do that? And it needs to be deconstructed, right, to really understand how these things work. Right? So <clears throat> Social Media Week in three years has grown to about 24 cities around the world. Um, we had we'll, we'll probably do about 60,000 physical attendees over the course of this year. Um, in each individual city, you have like a little bit, bit like she says in many ways, you have a, a localized kind of component to, to the local community. So you have a core company, you have an advisory group that sort of works on the periphery of that company. You then have a circle of social like, influence, influencers who, who collaborate, connect and work. Then you have the event partners, then you have the broader community, right? So it's like layer upon layer of um, people that are working together to make something happen times 24. To get to that point where we're in all of those different cities, all those different things happen, you have to start from one city. And you have to architect that, that structure um, and then replicate. And, and, and that's how you grow a community. It's not like this thing, it's not like this big amorphous thing that just like magically appears. It needs to be designed, it needs to be architected. And you see that as your job to hand over the template to the other cities. Uh, you know, absolutely. You, you, you know, first of all, you can't do any of this without creating frictionless paths for participation. You need to be able to, be able to you know, get involved and, 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 and collaborate and, and whatever, you know, participate in, in really frictionless ways. And so as soon as you start putting up barriers, people will just like, okay, this is, this is not going to work for me. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really about um, putting in place the architecture, giving people the tools, the resources, and the ongoing support, motivation, encouragement and from our perspective, what we're trying to do is figure out those like levers, the, sort of the incentive levers. How do we, where something's not working, how do we like adjust those levers so that people feel empowered or motivated or inspired to, to do what we are sort of encouraging them to do? And that's, you know, we'll probably talk a little bit more about this, but that's probably the most difficult aspect. Yeah. Of this. yeah. How you motivate a community? Yeah. Empowering them is really important, and how to do that, you know, it's not. Right. And I think empowering, empowering is a good word here because it's about. The, the more that, that you can empower the members of the community to support and engage and help you manage and, and improve the community, I think that is the, that's like the meta level of community management, right? Yeah. It's not just one person or, or the, the senior management or whatnot, but it's those people helping to inspire other, or other people to make something yeah. better. And, it, and it happens organically again, just because I love to interrupt. <laughs> um, for example, we have a community community manager on shelf, and she's essential to kind of bridge the gap between, you know, for example, what the client is asking for and what, you know, what the women are doing on the platform. But also, what we try to create is actually pro users in a way, like women that are just already been working on the platform really well and understand it to help the people that are starting. So, like, you know, like processes and things like Thomas told to me was talking a little bit about, like, as soon as people start understanding how it works in the community, then maybe users teach you. Uses, mm -hmm. you know, on how that community works, and I think that's really interesting. So, in your, in your case, you guys have a shared goal, right? So, I can see how across Social Media Week, Local Motors, and Shout, uh, Shout to some degree, like there, there's at least a sense of community, like you're all part of something, and there's a shared goal, right? General Assembly, there isn't, there's maybe shared beliefs or passions, but there isn't like something to be achieved in some way, right? As a group of people that are there, um, how, how does that? change why how people are motivated or at least like kind of how you when you when you talk about empowering people it, what is it as a, how does that work as a community when when there isn't kind of a clear this is the goal that we are trying to achieve if we've arrived sure um 
Yes, I think, I think you're right that there's not, the General Assembly community all is not aiming toward one goal. Um, actually, they're aiming all toward lots of different goals, yeah. um, personal goals, professional goals. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a, General Assembly is sort of a meta startup in the sense that it is a collection, at least on the membership, you know, resident community side. Um, it's a collection of all of these startups and entrepreneurs. We have like a hundred different individual companies who work on a General Assembly or part of the General Assembly community. That's not even counting the education side. Um, so they all work on different things. I think at the end of the day, it's a shared set of beliefs. And at the end of the day, at the very core, I think one of the very important things about it is that there's this camaraderie. And as that it's, it's very emotional at the end of the day. Um, it's this shared camaraderie knowing that as an entrepreneur, especially as someone who's an entrepreneur building a digital product or doing something sort of internet based, you really could be anywhere or in terms of your specific location where you work. You work out of a coffee shop, work out of your apartment, only use a laptop, you know, in this, in this sort of day and age to, to build a product and build a company. Um, you don't even have to be with your colleagues, you can work remotely. And yet, General Assembly is always filled. I mean, it's always filled. People are packed together on the couch and talking. And, and it's this idea that you don't have to be alone, right? Even if you're just sort of fighting and you're one or two or five people trying to build this company and get something off the ground and, and deal with failures and mistakes along the way, um, it's nice to know that there are other people who are having similar experiences who are in the same boat as you are. And while you're all driving for, toward your own goals, you know that you have that bond, and you know that you can help each other, and that other people can be useful and helpful to you, even if it's just like a, a sort of emotional support thing. Um, it can also manifest itself maybe more tangibly or more higher level in the form of, uh, you know, people around you might, might be able to provide feedback, they might be able to make introductions, they might be able to help you, in, 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 everyone can help each other achieve their own goals, and it's that network effect that comes into play where it's, Everyone has benefited by having lots of other people around them who can help help each other. Yeah, uh, that shared experience is just really impo important. I mean, uh, we started out, Local Motors started out as a company where we were very focused on uh, our Local Motors branded vehicles and whatnot. And we've had a huge shift recently where we're pulling away from uh, focusing on our company's vehicles and going into well, what are the, the, the vehicles and basically the automotive or vehicular inventions that other people want to do and how do we make it so that they can do that and I mean that this idea of having that uh, this idea of not being alone is core to that with uh, we have a number of projects that are that are going on, on in our community right now that are development projects and it's always the same story of well my background is X and I'm you know this far in my project but I need that last I need that last bit of insight from somebody who really knows what they're doing in this discipline that's completely foreign to me. And, uh, you know, I, where would I find this? Now they have this community where, through this shared passion of, of this one industry or this one pastime, they all have a common ground, even coming from separate dif disciplines, to get together and start helping, helping each other out. Furthermore, we even have the, the situation going on that you mentioned where uh, you might have you know, two people who are in the same stage of development with a vehicle, uh, you know, I have an EV over here that I'm trying to get going, I have a, uh, you know, a, a, a super efficient, you know, ICE vehicle that I'm trying to invent, this is core to my business, and you know, they can collaborate with each other and figure out what were their, what were their difficulties in terms of getting funding or aggregating designers to do their aesthetics or figuring out where to get these things produced, in, you know, the, uh, it all circles back to there's a reason why you call it community yeah. is because it's the aggregation of all of these people that might that that share that are so different and yet share that one unifying you know driver. So uh, I just want to disagree with your your, your first point about shared goals. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure I really believe that a community kind of shares the same goal. Um, to your point. Absolutely think they share values or philosophies or whatever you want to call it. I think it's important that those are clear to people as they join and become part of a community, but not share goals. I just want to make a t-shirt that says like I'm part of a community, yet I look up to number one. Because the reality is individuals care about themselves, their needs, their goals, and will gravitate towards something that, that I think helps them achieve that, 
but, but from a very sort of individual perspective. And people generally are not that community spirited or not that community uh, minded. Um, it, it's actually it's a tool for them to get where they want. Yeah, yeah. and, and, and I, I don't see that as a bad thing. Our job is to understand, you know, how to bring these people together to solve multiple problems and help people achieve multiple goals. That makes right. sense. Because yeah. looking out for number one for two individuals could be parallel. Yeah. The reason why it's not a bad thing, I mean, you could have you could have a situation where where you have somebody who is you know in a particular discipline or they have a particular background or that sort of thing, and they are willing to contribute to somebody else's project because they want to access that fame or access that recognition or get that compensation or whatnot. Yeah, they're looking out for number one, but the point is at the end of the day, once they've made that contribution, the receiver of that contribution, the guy who was uh, the, the person who threw up the flag for help or whatever the mechanism is, you know, they also are that much further down the road to their goals. In some cases, they're, they've just you know, traversed a distance that they would have had no way of doing it previously unless they had made that connection with this other self-interested individual, you know what I mean? So. so, but clearly you guys don't just say, okay, everyone's looking out for number one. Ayn Rand was right. Just let, let that shit happen. Um, I mean, you guys have decided to take certain things inside the organization that you, you resolve versus you kind of let the community resolve, right? And uh, Toby, you said a kind of a passing comment uh, over lunch that, that I think gets to the heart of this, which is like, well, voting obviously isn't the best way to get to get something out of community. Yet voting might be the most common, you know, tool I see applied in communities all the time because it feels democratic or something in some way. How, how do you decide, I mean, across any of your organizations, how do you decide this belongs, this is something we decide, you guys leave us to it for a second, versus, okay, this is for the group to decide, these people are all pulling in their own direction, but we're gonna let it play out. Like what? Who, whose head is on the chopping block generally is something that seems to be communicated very easily to people. I think the voting seems to translate well because, uh, like you said, it's got a, a, a diplomatic feel to it. Mm -hmm. So the community sort of accepts this and, and, and they receive it pretty happily. But the, so say we actually, we were just beginning to work on the engineering facet of our community. And so we were running some very sort of small controlled engineering products uh, or en engineering development projects for our internal car as a way to get the community involved in doing engineering projects with each other. And one of the things that, that we found was despite the fact that previously local motors had totally been known for this mechanism of, of at the end of the development process the community votes and that's how we determine our outcome, we just took a stand and we said there isn't going to be voting, basically local motors is going to be picking the, the uh, we're, we're going to be picking the solution and choosing the attributes that we, we you know, uh, acquire from our solution providers, our community participants. And the engineers who were participating in this or the designers or the backyard fabricators that were participating in this accepted this because they understood this relation of it was going on our product. So, at the end of the day, we were the ones who were going to have to, you know, take ownership of the idea, you know, be responsible for the for the performance of the idea. And uh, I, I mean, I think I think it's important that that uh, to see that there are a number of other dynamics, that are another or a number of other choice dynamics that a community can yeah. understand just simply because they're used to those relations, yeah. other than voting. Yeah, we have voting associated with commenting as well, but in terms of like. Um, because with us, what we're doing is basically outputting work that is either on the creative or advertising arena. You know, for us, it's kind of interesting to see how that completely reverses the creative processes. By because before, if you think advertising, or even if you were in the design agency, there's always like a creative head lead that chooses what is good and what's not. Um, on the public briefs on the platform, we're kind of kind of thinking of a new way of working, which is like, what if there is no creative director? It totally freaks out all of us in advertising, like every time when I'm on an advertising panel, this kind of mentality of like, who decides, who is the creative director? And I say, sometimes no one, you know, they all freak out. <laughs> like as if the world is gonna end. <laughs> but, but with us, you know, um, if the client chooses that it's gonna be public and it's gonna be by voting, it's gonna be completely democratic, so be it. Yeah. But like General Assembly, we also have a curated team that we work on the private layer. 
and if the client so decides, we'll cure it. So there is actually both. So, it's, so it can be totally open, democratic voting and commenting, or it could be like a curated thing where we pick. Bet, and I'm sorry, I'm going to be dense here for a second, because it feels like for, for Apollo and yourself, that's potentially different. Because to your point about everyone's looking out for number one, Toby, you guys are more in a challenge-based environment, right? I mean, someone when someone wins, everyone else loses, right? No, we're not. Sometimes. Oh, there isn't, no. So can you, can you guys just well, elaborate on Actually, I understand that um, uh, for a major company like Technisa, a um, large company, um, it's very important to have creators inside the company to somehow uh, understand what we are getting from the community and to choose what path we will follow uh, to get things done. Um, sometimes we, we launch challenges or we launch uh, specific um, challenges for the community, but uh, the, the most we get from that community is, is insights that will be created by our professionals. And uh, if we understand that there is an opportunity over there, we push forward again through the community that subject and try to to get more um, more ideas and more uh, opportunities from it uh, to to in order to, to, to get something done for our project. So I understand that not always for a large company uh, a community usually just give insights. They don't give the solution. I think it's different uh, when you talk about uh, like a service community mm -hmm. where things can be done online. In our case, it's a very professional uh, yeah, they can make uh, their own solution. Yeah, we can make it available online. Mm -hmm. So we have to have people uh, across the company engaged in that subject, uh, curating their ideas and seeing what what is really an opportunity for the company. Yeah. We, with us, with us, we kind of you know. This is why I'm not saying it's crowdsourcing because crowdsourcing is like that, you know, one person wins or two and everybody else loses and we try to make, we're trying to, we fought really hard and be, to make part of our business model to basically reward everybody on the platform. So what we did is basically every, every person who participates, comments, votes, has a little, a little pointing system associated to them and it's part of our model that if the client or the community doesn't pick their idea, you know, if they have a, a, a big, a, like let's say one point equals one dollar. If they have a hundred points, they will get a hundred dollars in the end of the year just for participating. So it's part of our model that we're going to reward people that just for participating. It doesn't matter if their idea gets picked or not. That's that's a really healthy thing to do too, because one of the reasons that, or one of the, there's this whole idea about how much can you really do with a community in terms of the quality that you can produce with it, and. One of, the, one of the reasons why this question of quality comes up sometimes is because people are, people are looking out for number one, so how do they look out for number one? There are a couple of ways that that can happen. On the one hand, it can be, well, I want to see my own personal idea flourish. Yeah, I'm on a larger project, but I have my little brainchild, and my biggest driver is I want to see this brainchild you know, be enacted on this particular project. And what happens when you create dynamics like you guys have where you have people winning, you have people winning even when their brainchild doesn't necessarily come to fruition. Is it starts getting people focused on the success being defined as the success of the project mm -hmm. and rather than success for themselves being, now, now the association is, man, I just want to be more associated with this project and I want it to go as well as possible because then I'm going to brag about being on that project as opposed to, I have nothing, no stake in this unless my widget gets on that thing and, and is produced and now I can say, point to that in a single piece and yeah, that was me, you know. Yeah, I think a really interesting idea to bring up at this point is this idea of karma, which is um, something that it can be incredibly powerful uh, in communities. Um, and it's this idea that, that I, as a, as a member of a community, I can actually further my own self-interest um, by being useful and helping other people in the community. And if you can if you can create those sorts of structures and allow that sort of thing to happen in your community, then then everybody then, then like it's this sort of rising tide situation where everyone will be better off by being active and participating in the community than than uh, if you were just on your own. And so a good example of that is uh, let's say I make an introduction to someone. Um, I, I, I introduce two people. 
at worst, no one gets any value from that. Um, it, 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 nothing happens, the introduction is not right, great. Basically, net zero loss. Um, but at best, ideally, one or ideally both of the people that I introduce will both gain value by having connected. Right? Let's say um, it's, a, it's a startup that's looking for a, a mobile developer. Connect your dots, they hire the person, everybody wins. And it actually even reflects well upon me. Um, so I get a little bit of uh, sort of cred from having connected those two people. But at the very least, I don't lose anything, right? By creating value and, and by giving value to one or, or possibly two other people, um, they uh, increase in their, their value, but I don't actually lose anything. And the more that I do that in a community, the more that I just give value without, uh, without actually losing any value myself, uh, the more likely it is that that value will eventually make it back to me in the form of uh, other people making introductions to me, other people connecting me, other with, with you know other people that are going to be more relevant to me, um, other people being useful, and so the more that I can I can do that, uh, the higher likelihood it is that that karma will come back. And I think that's in, in a really thriving community that karma concept is is all over the place, especially with repeated interactions. So um, I'm interested to know how, how you guys sort of implement this, and, and I know the notion of karma is. Um, exists in a number of these different sort of platforms that have communities that are required to make some sort of contribution. Um, karma really only works, in my opinion, if the person that is connecting those two dots is doing so selfishly, selflessly and, and is not consciously expecting anything in return. Because really, karma only comes back to those, theoretically, of course, um, to those people that, that, that just do this because it's the right thing to do, not because there's something in it for me. And what I worry is that we start to build in karma, the feature of karma, into these different platforms, into these communities, where it's a badge. You know, I've got 19 karma points or, or whatever it might be. And, and whilst that might be motivating, it, it's, it's slightly misleading because I'm not sure that it's in the spirit of, of karma. And it may just dampen the quality of what you know. Then are you just making noise for the same thing? Yeah, potentially. And I have to take nothing away from, from the example we gave, it's exactly right. Yeah. Uh, we actually thought about having, early on, we created a or something, thought about having some sort of karma point system where if you, um, if you introduced a new potential member or you taught a class or you made an introduction or you, you know, hosted happy hour or something, whatever it was, that you could increase points and you could spend those points in like non financial situations. Um, we decided not to do that because of this very, very point. because. Once you start to, I think, it's a sort of like routinizing um, social capital and sort of um, this almost like intangible idea of karma. Once you routinize it into an economic transaction, yeah. uh, the economics change, right? So with social capital, I can make an introduction between two people, and as I said, I do not lose anything. I, I'm not giving you a dollar and you gain a dollar. I'm losing nothing, other two people gain. But once you routinize it into like more traditional, more traditional academic model, then I think you lose the, the magic that could come out of uh, that idea. Sydney and I were chatting today, and um, uh, BBH has participated in the social media week for a number of years now. And in New York, they really sort of threw themselves at the opportunity to, to you know, create value for the community, host events, spearhead events, curate events, um, have like as many different employees throughout the city participating. And the value that was created for BBH is almost impossible to measure. It's so complex to try and figure out all of those individual contributions and what it ultimately means, but it's inherent. Like I hope it's inherent. It certainly was from our conversation that for BBH, the reason why you guys were so motivated to get involved is because you get so much back, um, and that for me is inspiring. That inspires me to continue to try and develop a better and more efficient infrastructure that makes that as frictionless as possible. And yet the other board members of BBH have asked me to quantify that value. So. <laughs> Spend some money with us next time, and we'll help you quantify. Actually, can you excuse us, Toby, and I would like to arm wrestle now. <laughs> uh, so I do want to just. Uh, where are we on time? Did we step up. Okay. Because um, there's no way communities are good at everything, right? Communities have to suck at stuff. Um, so I would love to hear, uh, and this is kind of open-ended. Like, what what are the limits of what is even reasonable to, to think a community can do? Or do you guys sincerely believe that? There's a set of processes or uh, a set of a type of empowerment, et cetera, that can solve anything. I, 
I think one of the biggest things where I, I don't necessarily want to want to say that communities will always suck at this, but currently, currently the big the big trouble that you have is just uh, is just the same thing that drives the community to be so productive, which is their collective enthusiasm, passion, you know, disciplines, interests, skills, all that stuff is the same thing that can totally mire them. Uh, if, if they have to take on too much of the management of an effort. So, you know, you have this huge group of people, this massive horsepower of skill and whatnot, but they still all, if left to their own devices, will choose a very individual way to go and investigate and throw their energy at. And that's the same mechanism, you know, again, it's the same mechanism which makes them so valuable, but that, you know, if there's no project management or, or direction or something like that, they can easily, you can easily have groups that will spin off and all of that, that energy or that potential innovative energy will just go to, go in useful directions, but not, they, they won't be valuable because they won't be in parallel with each other. So you guys have actually made a, made a call with the community. Right? And yet there are all sorts of online communities trying to make cars together all the time outside of local motor. Um, I haven't seen another example work, right? Is that the reason? Is it that you, you because by signing up for this particular community, you're bringing that to the table? Or what, what's the difference? Why, why do these self-organizing groups not make cars? I, I think it, it's probably one of the major differences. You see a, a ton of, you see a ton of examples of cars out there that are either open source projects or they are especially green vehicles or all of these very, uh, these vehicles that are running around these, these hyped topics currently. And so you get a, a huge swell of enthusiasm from people coming to participate in these projects and you get some really, really impressive uh, individuals coming in and wanting to contribute to that. But the, the problem is that you get these groups of individuals in there and they are so diverse that, that they all are ready to work on their one focus and they just get started with it and they line out. And in the beginning it looks great because so much is happening at once, but before long you realize that, you, you know, like, like building the house, you have to start, you know, you have to lay the foundation and build up from there. And what is ending up happening is somebody's trying to start doing the roofing and whatnot before the guy comes in to do the walls, you know. And uh, one of the things that we found, and granted with, with the car that we produce right now, the Rally Fighter, it wasn't, we, we've already sort of passed uh, past the level to which we enacted uh, this on that project, uh, project, but definitely there, there was this sense of, uh, you know, now, now we are going to, we're going to t set the tempo. Now we're going to work on X system, or now we're going to focus on this particular, you know, mechanism or this subsystem. And uh, it actually, you think of it that maybe you're going to be restricting the innovation that can happen with the community because you're cinching down the box and you're uh, constricting on, on people's dry, you know, enthusiasm to, to uh, produce and create. But a lot of times people actually seem to respond well to it in the community and be thankful for it because, uh, because they start seeing the actual collaboration happen because now everybody, every, people like working on projects where everybody feels unified and, and driven towards the same goal. So it's not that you necessarily need to to say, you know, you can't work on anything else right now, but you just at least start the suggestion of a tempo of understand we need to do this before that, and then they being hugely talented individuals pick this up and run with it, and you know, now you actually start producing usable goods and usable outcomes. It's interesting though, you said, you know, again, I want, I'd love to know if you guys believe, because what you basically said is you have to provide the community X to achieve why. But I haven't heard anyone say like flat out communities, there's just certain things that communities cannot do. I mean, is, if you guys sincerely believe, you know, uh, generally a community can get to a goal as long as you put the right pieces in place? I mean, versus just things that, that companies internalize for themselves? I understand that the, the, the limit of community is related to the kind of people that we need. Like, uh, if you have a complex, a complex goal to achieve, uh, you have to have uh, very different uh, kinds of people inside the community to develop that goal. But uh, usually you don't have that variety of, of people.
people inside the community. We have specialized people uh, with, uh, that shares the same values. So uh, usually you can just achieve uh, specific tasks through a community. So the limit for me is always related to the kind of people that you can engage in your community. Also, sorry, I was going to say, you know, communities are amorphous. Um, you know, so if you need them to, you know, click vote or like or something, they're awesome. You know, right. um, but the the more complex the task, yeah. um, uh, the more you're asking of the community, yeah. the smaller that group needs to become. Groups are amazing at accomplishing incredibly complex things. Communities are, and if a if a great community is made up of lots of small groups who are working collaboratively together and are somehow connected to each other so you have an openness that encourages participation from kind of all levels, then, yeah. then you probably yeah. got some I, I agree with that. And I think we're all kind of saying the same thing. Like, you have to, you have to kind of give them somewhat, this, not a specific, to, specific task, but something more tactical and tangible. I think if it's too open, too blue skies, I think it's kind of a mess free for all kind of thing. But if you kind of, you know, if you kind of zone in a little bit, it tends to work better. Yeah, pose um, the question. Yeah, it tends, in, 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 my, in our experience. And because our output is kind of advertising and creative, I would say, for example, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm dying to be wrong on this, I'm dying to be wrong on this, but I would say that our community couldn't come up with like a, the next, let's say, priceless campaign for MasterCard that involves deep research, you know, and like in this overall unified global campaign. But I think we could do very tactical things inside one idea. But having said that, I really want to be wrong about this. <laughs> I think if people, if, if the like areas of expertise of the people involved in the community is one um, limiting factor, I think the other limiting factor, which we're talking about um, maybe more specifically, is the infrastructure, right? The platform, uh, the levers, as you define them. Um, how do you incentivize people? What tools um, and ways of organizing smaller groups do they have at their disposal to actually get stuff done? What are the, what are the sense of structure look like? How, how easily they can they connect? Um, imagine, you know, think, think about like the real world analogy of going um, with a group of people out to a restaurant, right? Um, you come out of work or something, you don't know which restaurant you're going to go to, and you're with a group of four or five people, right? It's probably a good size um, between the four or five of you uh, and your own knowledge of, of you know, like good New York restaurants you'll probably be able to come up with a really awesome place, it's in the neighborhood, everyone can agree to it and you'll go. Um, imagine trying to go out to a group, to a restaurant with a group of 100 people. Like 100 people come out of work and you have to somehow get to a restaurant. Um, it'd probably be terrible. You know, the, the, the average, the like, aggregate intelligence of that mob of 100 people is probably incredibly low, whereas the aggregate intelligence of a group of four or five people is probably high and probably even higher than just a group of like one or two people. Um, but now, Let's say you were to try to, you really wanted to leverage that mob of 100 people. Well, maybe there was a leader or there was some sort of plan of attack, there was some sort of infrastructure, set of rules that people went into the mob with and then said, okay, everyone break off into you know, random groups or somehow semi-organized groups of four or five people, right? So you have 20, 25 individual groups. They all go out to a restaurant, different restaurants one night, or 20 different restaurants. They report back, they figure out which restaurants were the best, they eventually narrow it down, you come up with like the top two or five restaurants, and then you know, you've leveraged this entire network of 100 people in smaller groups to come up and sort of bubble up the best restaurant that you can all find. It's, it's a fantastic example actually, and, and I think um, we're in, in such an important kind of phase right now as we start to all become aware of the importance of, of open technology. Right? And, and what open technology uh, and, and open communications, or whatever you want to call it, is providing us is the ability to seamlessly connect that small group with the mob. Because in the mob, you might actually have an individual who has an incredible amount to contribute to that small group. And as long as it's frictionless, as long as it's open, it's easy for the interaction to take place. Um, but if we try to sort of operate in, in sort of silos based on the idea of, well, you know what, four to six people is right, we've got it, we don't need any outside sort of help, um, then it's, we're not going to progress and we're not going to innovate. I think as, as humans, we're relatively good at just intuitively understanding how to 
get stuff done with a small group of people with us. We don't need much technology. We don't need a whole lot of infrastructure and rules and, and um, texture to that. We can just, it, it comes very naturally to us, right? Um, but it's much harder for, I think, individuals or people to figure out, okay, how do I organize a hundred group, a group of a hundred people? And that's where, you know, building technologies, building platforms, building infrastructures to help us do that, um, and sort of get past these, these, get past the limits of our intuition. That's where stuff gets really interesting and powerful. I'm actually going to just pause this there and just open it up for, for Q&A. Uh, any questions out of the audience? Uh, we have one over there. Um, I'd like to address Ali's question earlier about how do you how do you make sure that you're not missing the next uh, the next priceless campaign? Because one of the things I'm curious about, um, I, I work. My name is Christy. I work with Instructables. Um, so one of the challenges for us is curating content and making sure that from the huge amounts of stuff that comes in, you do find all the good stuff and bring it up. And one of the things I find very challenging when you don't necessarily have someone, we're, we thankfully are small enough that we're able to, to view everything that comes in. But when you're talking about grand scale, how do you make sure that um, you're not missing something that is totally paradigm shifting and maybe maybe most of the people who are, who are say, upvoting or you know giving a thumbs up or whatever, whatever the voting mechanism is, aren't dismissing it because it's coming out of left field and maybe it's going to be the next absolutely brilliant thing. Well, uh, you know, I think, I, think, I think there's a lot of possibility for not missing it because it's not uh, a kind of, you know, especially on kind of creative work because we're not working on the traditional one person the creative director decides. I think doing it, uh, you know, uploading whatever you want gives you a lot of, um, of room to actually get something from left field. More so, actually, I would argue than agencies because we all have something, we all, we all see something, and it happened before. We, we had someone who wasn't on the necessarily that discipline. So let's say, let's say it was a brief about writing a script, like an, a, an ad script. So someone who was actually a project manager wrote it. And that was something that 